These two walls represent the walls of the blood vessels inside your brain. Now, come around here. Sand and I are now inside the blood vessel. So the blood is on this side, and out here is the brain tissue. And through the blood vessel wall, the brain gets all the good stuff it needs to perform all its vital functions, like oxygen and nutrients. The trouble is, the brain needs protecting from any nasty stuff in the blood, like bacteria, viruses or toxins. And that is where the blood-brain barrier comes in. It's represented on this model by this mesh. In your body, it's made by joining up the cells that line your blood vessels very tightly so that only the good stuff can get to your brain. Now, wait a minute, Zon. My blood vessel wall doesn't have a blood-brain barrier. What's going to happen to my brain? Well, Chris, we're about to find out. Chris and I each have a bucket of balls. They represent blood molecules carrying good stuff like oxygen and glucose and some nasty stuff like bacteria and viruses. We have one minute to push the molecules through our blood vessel walls into our brains. But whose brain will be happiest at the end? Three, two, one, go! This is great, Zon. My blood molecules are all going through the wall with practically no effort at all. Ah! Chris! This blood-brain barrier mesh is stopping me getting these big molecules through into my brain. Finish! <laughs> well, Zon, that was easy for me. I managed to get every last one of my molecules through. Well, I had much more trouble because of my blood-brain barrier. I didn't manage to get everything through. But if we have a look at the molecules that we both let through, we're going to see that I'm the one with the brain that's smiling. Let's check it out. Here I've got a glucose molecule. This one is a vitamin and I've got oxygen. And my brain loves and needs all of these essential molecules. Now, let's see what you've let in, Chris. So I've got a great big molecule here that's a... Uh... Oh, dear. I have a bacteria called Salmonella. That shouldn't be in my brain. This one is a parasite called Cryptosporidium. And I've got an E. coli bacteria, something that should normally only be found in poo. Ugh, you don't want any of this stuff in your brain, Chris. That's horrible. None of these bad things should be in my brain tissue. They can all make me extremely poorly. That's because I didn't have a blood-brain barrier. Whereas my brain is tip-top and healthy because its intact blood-brain barrier let in all the good stuff and stopped any of the nasties getting through. So we've shown you that your brain is packed with blood vessels. And you have a blood-brain barrier to filter your blood and keep your brain healthy and safe. Hi, Mum. Yeah, we need a hand. And I'm afraid you're going to have to bring us some equipment, too. I think a, a screwdriver, maybe some bolt cutters. I was just trying to see if I could get through the blood-brain barrier. So how long do you think it'll take to get here? Five hours. No, no Five problem. hours? I'll see you in a bit. Bye. But Chris? Chris? I need a wee. Chris? <laughs> Meet Caden, Maisie, Bolu and Millie. We'll be following them across the series as they let us know what it's like to be a regular hospital outpatient. They invite us into their lives, at home and as they undergo treatment. Meet 11-year-old Maisie. Hello. Maisie lives with her mum, dad, brother and dog Poppy. She has celiac disease. It means that you can't have gluten, which is wheat, barley, rye, malt and oats. And as a result, Maisie is unable to eat everyday food such as bread, pasta and pizza. If I eat gluten, I end up getting the runs, I get sharp stomach pains, I feel sick and I just basically want to lie in bed and go to sleep. Maisie is so sensitive to gluten that everything food-related has to be separated to avoid her coming into contact with it. So I have my own ketchup and butter to make sure that no cross-contamination goes on there. We've started doing a lot more home cooking and baking since I've been celiac. So we make gluten-free chicken nuggets. We grated frozen gluten-free loaf and then we put it onto the chicken. It's lots of fun. Luckily for Maisie, there are also special gluten-free versions of some of her favourite takeaway foods. So we're watching a film and I've got a gluten-free pizza and Jess has a normal pizza because she's normal. So we're enjoying our sleepover. Find out how I get on next time. Bye! 
Now we're going ouch and about, bringing our mobile clinic to you. We've come to a theme park to help solve your medical mysteries. Zand is preparing the clinic ready for his first patient, while Chris is out in the park to answer your burning questions. At the clinic, Zand is open for business. Can I have the next patient, please? First up, it's not that dark. It's eight-year-old Thomas, and he's had a mouthful of his problem. So, Thomas, why have you come to the Ouchmobile today? Well, I've hardly lost any of my milk teeth, but all my friends have. What's the diagnosis, Zand? Sounds to me like a case of I've hardly lost any of my milk teeth, but all my friends have itis. Excellent diagnosis. How many have you lost? I've lost four. Yeah, and I've got one lucky one. Right, let's have a look. Give that one a wobble for me. Oh, that's brilliant. Look at that. And part of the explanation is that everyone's different, right? Like, you and your friends are all going to be different sizes, you've all got different colour hair, I and mean, there's lots of different things about you, and your teeth are one of those different things. You're also all different ages, and in your case, there isn't anything to worry about. Zahn's right, Thomas. It's all good. <laughs> now I'm out and about, solving more medical mysteries. What causes hiccups? Do you ever get a thing where your eyelid flickers a little bit and you can't control it? Hiccups are a bit like that. It's the muscle under your lungs called your diaphragm. When the diaphragm spasms, you get that hick. Dr Chris, why do we get trapped lips in the winter? It's because in the summer we sweat and so we leak lots of grease out from our pores, which keeps our skin nice and moist. And in the winter that doesn't happen. So when we lick our lips, we dry them out even more because we lick the grease off them. And so that's when they start flaking and peeling and cracking. Does that make sense? Yes. Back at the Ouchmobile, some fellow twins are in the waiting room. Next patient, please. But their question is all to do with their differences. So, India, Orchid, what's brought you to the Ouchmobile? I'm right-handed and I'm left-handed. I've got bigger feet and I got smaller feet. I'm shorter and she's taller. And we want to know why. Double trouble. What's the diagnosis, Doc? This sounds like a case of right twin, left twin, big foot, small foot, tall twin, short twin itis. Sounds twintastic. Who's the older twin? I'm the older twin. I'm the older twin, actually, as well. How much older are you? I'm seven minutes older than Dr. Chris. Ah, uh, we're well, ten. I'm ten. You're ten minutes. minutes. So you're taller, older bigger feet. Yeah. So it's quite interesting. So when twins are developing inside their mum before they're born, there isn't as much room as there would be if there's just one baby. And one twin is usually a bit bigger than the other. It's a bit of competition for nutrients. So it looks like, India, you've just been the slightly larger twin. Were you bigger when you were born? Uh, I think by one pound or something. By about a pound. I think that's probably the explanation if you've just always been the slightly larger twin. And the left-handed thing? Normally in the population, people who aren't twins, about one in ten people is left-handed. But in twins, it's actually one in five, so it's twice as common. But no one's exactly sure why. Dear Orchid, thanks very much for coming in. It's really nice to have twins on the show. Job done for today. Clinic closed. <laughs> Ouch. That's not how you grow organs. Don't. Here's Investigation Ouch. This is how it's done. Now, don't worry, somebody isn't missing an ear. This one was made in a laboratory. Let's meet the real-life Dr Frankenstein who built it and find out more about how replacement body parts are made. This is Professor Alex Cephalian. He is working at the Royal Free Hospital in London creating body parts out of a special substance called bioplastic. So what are you making here? You make an artery to replace damaged artery in the body. Now, an artery is a blood vessel that carries blood from your heart out to the rest of your body. And this machine is making artificial arteries by squeezing liquid bioplastic over a tube. This solidifies in water, and then when you peel it off, hey presto, you have an artery. So this is two millimeters, a very small artery. What's so amazing about this is I've handled real human arteries and this is how they feel. So could an artificial artery like this one be put inside a human being? Yes, it goes in the heart or it goes into the leg. Lots of things can happen to arteries. They can get injured, they can burst, they can get blocked. That's what happens when you have a heart attack. So if you can make an artificial artery that works, you can save millions of lives. 
But it's not just arteries Alex is creating here. There are more complex organs being made too. OK, this is ear scaffold. Oh, so it feels very much like a real ear? Yes, indeed. But you couldn't just sew this onto a human body, could you? No, because you need to be covered with a stem cell. Stem cells stop the body rejecting the new ear, but what are they and how do they work? Well, different parts of your body are made up of different types of cells. They're everywhere. Your blood, your brain and even your hair. But stem cells live in your organs and bones too, and they're like spares. They don't have a job yet, and they're waiting to be told what to do. What's brilliant is that scientists have found a way to program stem cells, giving them specific jobs. Feel your ear right now. All that grisly stuff, that's cartilage. Now, Alex takes stem cells from the person who needs the new ear, and he puts the stem cells onto the plastic ear, and he tells them to become cartilage cells. The stem cells grow all over the plastic ear so that it won't be rejected by the body. But even with the magic stem cells, this still looks like a plastic ear. It needs skin over it. Now, Alex has done the next bit of the procedure overseas, and it went like this. Imagine I'm the patient. He placed the artificial ear covered in stem cells under the skin of the patient's arm so that it gets a good blood supply and skin grows all over it. Then, the ear, covered in the patient's own skin, is removed and repositioned where you'd normally expect to find an ear. Awesome! But Alex doesn't stop at ears. Oh, no. Two years ago, he performed the world's first successful transplant of an artificial windpipe. What's absolutely amazing about this is that doctors are now able to make replacement body parts that actually live inside your body. Now, it's early days, but hopefully soon they'll be able to make any body part. In the meantime, the next thing on Alex's list is a nose. I wonder who's going to end up with this? We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. This is a rapid response vehicle, and it's on standby 24-7 to respond to whatever emergency calls coming in. Today, I'm going along for the ride, and guess what? You're coming with me. Jan can take 10 to 15 emergency call-outs in a day, and a new case is just in. So we've had a 999 call to a 53-year-old lady who's injured her ankle. So it could be anything from a simple sprain to blood loss, severe pain, and maybe some other cause for the fall that could be life-threatening as well. So we've got to get there quickly, find out what's going on. The call has taken us right into the centre of town. Hello. 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 Is it Linda? It is. What's it? happened? What? Tripped over the man Oh, that. just the edge of that raised platform yeah. there. Okay. So was you knocked unconscious at all? No. Have you hit your head or the back of your neck or your back at all? No. What have you injured? My knee and my ankle. OK. Are you able to bend your knee at all? I do, but my ankle hurts. Your ankle hurts when you bend it? OK. Yeah. Press down on my hand. Push down as hard as you can. Where does that hurt when you push down? On my ankle. On the outside? Yeah. Linda's ankle is clearly causing her a lot of pain. So it may just look like Jan's feeling her ankle, but in fact, she's feeling in very particular places. There's a set of rules called the Ottawa Ankle Rules, and they help you decide whether they're likely to have broken a bone. So Jan's trying to figure out which bits are tender. That'll tell us whether she needs to go to hospital. Yeah, I'm going to need Emma back up for this patient. She's unable to wait there, um, needs an X-ray. Using the Ottawa rules, Jan has decided that the ankle is probably broken and Linda does need an ambulance. The moment she's quite uncomfortable, we're managing to keep her warm, but she can't walk on that leg. So we need to get her to hospital and get her an X-ray. She can be treated from there. It's important to keep it still so that if she's got any bones that are broken, if the edges rub together, it can create a lot of pain and it can create some bleeding, which will make the ankle worse as well. You're doing it, that's it. Well done, darling. Are you able to twist around a little bit? There you go. It's really good that Jan was able to assess her really quickly, get her an ambulance and get her to hospital where she needs to be. And once there, the doctors discovered Linda's ankle was broken and it was soon fixed. 